unavoidable, the unavoidable outcome. That is, we shall all die and we shall all be resurrected. <coughs> and Allah tells us it is he who gives life to the dead earth when it seems completely lifeless. And he subhanahu wa ta'ala causes it to vibrate with life. He, it is he subhanahu wa ta'ala also will cause the dead to come to life and to vibrate with life and to be held accountable for the way he or she lived life. A principle most fundamental in our existence, a principle most fundamental to us as Muslims, and that we implore Allah Azza wa that whatever pursuits we have for livelihoods in this world, no matter what they are, that that does not keep us distracted or uh, neglectful of, uh, or, or unmindful of this reality. That this is the ultimate outcome. And that to forget it to, to, is to forget one's life. To forget it is to forget one's um, uh, destiny. And we cannot do that. And Allah Azza wa Jal keeps reminding us of this everywhere in the Quran. And that's one of the most uh, axiomatic uh, teachings of Islam. And it is one of the sixth. One of the six what? It is one of the six what? You should complete the sentence. It's obvious. No? Huh? No? Arkan al Iman. It is one of the six Arkan of Iman. Arkan al Iman. Everybody should know that. I hope everybody here does. One of the six arkan al iman, one of the six most fundamental pillars of faith, is to believe clearly and without doubt that I shall be resurrected after death and I shall be held to account. One of the six pillars of faith, of iman. <clears throat> My dear brothers and sisters, says in what we recited, uh, from Surah, first of all, Ayah 29, the first Ayah we recited, the meaning of which you heard, but let's just, let just feel more of that meaning. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا رَبَّنَا أَرِنَا الَّذَيْنِ أَضَلَّانَا مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنْسِ نَجْعَلْهُمَا تَحْتَ أَقَدَامِنَا لِيَكُونَا مِنَ الْأَسْفَلِينَ That's a scenario, that's a scene rather, that's a scene of the scenes of the Day of Judgment. And on the Day of Judgment, as also the Qur'an teaches us, and we have in some of the khawatir of after Isha, Allah teaches us that on the Day of Judgment, people shall be brought together, friends, acquaintances, individuals, as well as groups and nations and so on. And they shall be held to account and they shall entertain sometimes talks with one another, each one blaming the other. You have caused us to err. We have followed you. We have imitated you. You did this to us. And the other, side, the other party would say, no, I did not force you. You made your own choice. Don't blame it on me. And that's a scene in which Allah Azzawajal tells us both of them shall enter, shall end in the same abode of torment in, in, in Jahannam. And here it is, it is again, again humans with whom? With jinns. Humans with jinns. Have you ever seen a jinn? No. Most have never seen a jinn. But the suggestions suggestions, the so-called sometimes inspirations, some of them, are from shayateen ul-jinn, and from the shayateen that are jinn anyways, the shayateen of jinn. And, and there are those who in some way, in the way they view life and in the way they behave, would have 
taken jinns, shayateen of jinns, as basically uh, acquaintances and friends and allies and sort of uh, gave allegiance to them, not in necessarily a direct way, but in the way they conduct themselves in lives. You know, these, these feelings sometimes people have, these drives sometimes people have, could be from shayateen, inserted through a means of communication that still many of us don't understand. In other words, don't understand in, in terms of scientifically, in laboratories. And then there are those feelings and those notions and those drives and those understandings that drive a person to do this or not do that, or think this or not think that, or accept this or not accept that. And that's sometimes from shayateen of jinn. On the Day of Judgment, such people, and it could be even more so, it could be for some people who had actually some sort of, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, in the realm of parapsychology, Right? A relationship to jinns. And had somehow, you know, lived some part of their lives or, or a great deal of their lives uh, receiving instructions from these jinns, from these shayati in a more direct, like parapsychological way. That alone what I mentioned earlier. And on the Day of Judgment, these two kinds of people, or these two individuals of creatures, or these two kinds of creatures, again will be summoned to face each other and to be examined, quote-unquote, and cross-examined. And here it is a scene. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا and those who rejected and denied of the kuffar, many of them are like that. رَبَّنَا أَرِنَا الَّذَيْنِ أَضَلَّانَا مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنْسِ نَجْعَلُمَا تَحْتَ أَقْدَامِنَا O oh, our Lord, show us, let us see that jinn and that human that led us astray. Because in life, you know, we followed them. We received their instructions, we accepted them, show them to us. Ah, in other words, with, this is a, with, with a sense of vindictiveness and sense of hate and despair and hasra, show them to us. Rabbana arina ladaini they both, jinn and ins. Ins we know, we've talked about it, now it was even jinns. Ladaini adallana in a genuine insi, show them to us so that نجعلهما تحت أقدامنا so that we lay them under our feet ليكونا من الأسفلين so that they be of the lowest and despised even more so. والعياذ بالله and therefore on the day of judgment friends, allegiances, acquaintances are of no avail to anyone. As a matter of fact, on the Day of Judgment, some people who had of us close, fr close friends, close allies, beloved ones, but they were kafir, or kuffar amongst themselves, billah, or rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Each one will be absolving himself or herself from the other. No. الأخلاء يومئذ بعضهم لبعض عدو إلا المتقين says Allah عز وجل somewhere else there's no voice maybe I haven't turned it on well it is on but the battery is dead <coughs> they're going to repair it the sisters have to come here until they make the, they repair the battery uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran somewhere else, Al Akhilla'u Bahuhum li Bahin Adubun illa al Muttaqeen. Al Akhilla, that is the very close and intimate friends in this dunya, in the day of judgment, shall be enemies to one another, except Al Muttaqeen. 
except those in this dunya who had, alhamdulillah, who had uh, friendship with one another, and loved one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and lived lives, jazakallah, and lived lives that were virtuous and in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Illa al-muttaqeen. And that again, uh, that ayah reminds us of this that we recited. And thus, this teaches us that in this life, we should strive to live a life in consciousness of Allah Azza wa Jal, orienting our hearts towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through tawheed, and live our lives and strive to live our lives with senses use our eyes and ears and tongues and hands and legs and, and energies to strive to do that which pleases Allah, that is to walk straight. And then walk straight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thumma staqam. And then I think uh, Friday we did comment on this next ayah briefly. In the ladhina qalu wa rabbuna allahu thumma staqamu tatanazzalu alayhimu al-malaikatu alla takhafu wa la tahzanu and so on. We did make a comment this past Friday. So <clears throat> we have read basically the basic translation of it. And for the sake of time, I'm going to go to the next part of it. After this, when Allah Azza wa Jal tells us about those who again, qalu rabbun Allah, that's the way to orient your life and your heart and your mind and your soul and your spirit towards Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is very important for me and you to understand. These words I'm trying to share with you in, in, in hopefully helping us not only know, but I think feel the meaning of Qalu Rabbun Allah. Qalu Rabbun Allah. Those who internalize the Tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jal in their, in their hearts and in their minds and in their souls. This is it, in other words, the, the, the design inside of me, the design of my plan of life inside of me is done inside of me. It's like something like that. Allah, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. In other words, everything is done inside, compact. Now the way I'm going to express it outside simply is expressing that which is inside of me. Are you with me? And unless I'm conscious of that and I have that, that means everything I am going to uh, project in my life, everything that is projected in my life, i.e. everything I say, everything I do, or I don't, is consistent and must be consistent, stems from that internal reality I have accepted and formulated everything. And that's where we miss. When I and you, in our external lives, the way we speak, the way we eat, the way we, we dress, the way we talk, the way we behave, the choices we make, the fears, the hopes, the loves, the dislikes, all of those are, are sometimes deficient because the deficiency inside of us of Rabbun Allah. And thus, we do certain things externally inconsistent with that internal reality. And that's where the mediocrity happens. And the clearer that is in our hearts of that principle, number one, the clearer, very clear, without ambiguity. Second, the more certain we are of it. The more certain we are of it. Huh? Thirdly, the more committed we are to it internally, then comes the external uh, realization of it. And to that extent, it will be more and more beautiful and more and more consistent. And thus our lives are expressing, our external lives are expressing that internal reality. That's why in this in this sentence everything is said. Everything is said. And the outcome of that, these are awliya Allah, these are the special awliya of Allah Azza wa The angels descend upon them. 
and are telling them in this life, there are some ulama say, and as also the text implies, when they are dying at the moment of death, and in the realm of the barzakh, in the realm of the beyond, and in the realm of beyond the beyond, in akhirah, in resurrection. In this dunya also, the angels descend powerfully upon them. One or, in other words, frequently, one after the other, giving them this beautiful glad tidings. Do not fear and do not grieve. Allah is with you throughout your life, at your death, after your death, in the grave, in the barzakh, and in resurrection and beyond. The result of what? This is the result of what? In this one sentence. And I emphasized last time, thumma staqam. What did we say? Thumma. Why thumma? Thumma clearly in the Arabic language implies what? Thereafter. Why thumma staqam? Why thumma here? What did we emphasize? No? Before that, must be Rabbun Allah. Tawheed is a must. الذين قالوا ربنا الله that's first in other words if actions come that seem to be attractive and beautiful that does not produce that result necessarily no before that one must have ascertained and internalized the tawheed of Allah إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقام it's not only deeds without Rabbun Allahu. Rabbun Allahu before the deeds. Thumma. That should always be so. That's why you enter into the realm of Islam by what? Not by doing, by doing good deeds. That's not what enters me in Islam. What enters me in Islam first? La ilaha illallah. قالوا ربنا الله لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله and then الحمد لله from then on good deeds are very important and are called for anyways and I want to come to the next point uh, we have said few things about that last time ومن أحسن twenty was it thirty two 33. ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين. Excuse me. Read right. that meaning. We are your protectors in this life and in the hereafter. Therein shall ye have all that your soul shall desire. Therein shall ye have all that ye ask for. Keep going, keep going. A hospitable gift from one oft forgiven, most merciful. Right here. Now I want him, what I read is he's going to read. That who, is, who is better in speech than one who calls men to Allah, works righteousness, and says, I am of those who bow in Islam. That's it. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ The meaning of which, a translation of which you heard. Subhanallah, do you see something very special here? Allah told us before that what? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ استقام. And the rewards for that, the beautiful spiritual rewards for that. And then right after that, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِنْ مَنْ دَعَى اللَّهُ Who is better in speech than the one who invites to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After, this is after, you say, 
you internalize inside of you la ilaha illallah rabbi allah imagine a person living constantly with a spiritual voice inside of him or her rabbi allah rabbi allah imagine that rabbi allah and externalizing that through a straight orientation towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through righteous action beloved to allah and his rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wasallam now the natural thing after that is to invite to that Invite to Rabbun Allah. Second, invite to Istiqama. To walk in straight. And therefore, he tells us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, now, if you want to, no, it's like in meaning, in a in subtle way. If you like to talk, in other words, as a mu'min, as a muwahid, as a mustaqim, you should not like to talk. Yet people talk. But if you like to talk, you know what's the best of talk? You know what's the best of talk? That's, that's what he says. Who is better in speech? Who is better in words than this one? Who is this one? Da'a ilallah. After that state first that he mentioned, now to invite to Allah. And that is the best of speech is simply, after the words of Allah Azzawajal, is to say words, the meanings of which are about inviting to this paradise that you are now discovering or you have discovered by the grace of Allah in your heart first and in your life first and then in the hereafter to invite others to. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ Da'a ilallah. And you become a person who is in da'wa to Allah. And what is da'wa to Allah? It's invitation. It's not proselytization. It's invitation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We invite, number one. And Allah Azza wa in the Quran tells us that He is the first one who invites to Himself subhanahu wa ta'ala to the home of peace. He's the first one who does da'wah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that da'wah means to invite. He's the one and the first one, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the ultimate one who invites to his house. You invite somebody to your house. So he invites us to his house. And what's his house? Jannah. What is called uh, his house? Jannah is called in the Quran also. The house of peace, Darus Salam. Allah says in the Quran, Wallahu yad'u ila daris salam. Wallahu yad'u ila daris salam. And verily Allah invites to the home of peace. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you are one who is a da'i, you cannot be that da'i unless you are a da'i to Allah, meaning to the house of Allah, meaning to paradise, meaning to the home of peace. The home of peace, ultimately Jannah. And of course, many know, many know that those who are like that have already entered a home, on, a home of peace in this dunya in their hearts and to that they are inviting others the home of peace second وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ excuse me when we invite someone to our house obviously if we are a good host we should invite someone to our house and when he comes whom does he find? He should find us, right? He shouldn't find us there. Can you imagine inviting somebody to my house and then when he comes, I run away. I'm not there. I run away before he comes or I'm not there or it's not even my house. How does it sound? How does it sound? Hmm? Ugly. Ugly, even maybe vile and criminal, maybe even. 
So what, does this, what is this telling you and me? When we invite someone to the home of peace, to Allah, to virtue, to goodness, to righteousness, to correctness, I should be where? I should be there. I should be there. I should not invite someone to where I am not or where I don't want to be. It will not be proper, it will not be effective, it will not be blessed. And therefore, most of us who are so deficient in our, <clears throat> uh, in our works of, of virtue, we should at least know and commit ourselves to be striving, to be striving to be there, to be earnestly and truthfully and humbly striving to be there and recognizing that we are striving and recognizing where we are, we are not there yet. And yet we might be inviting, if we do, with those conditions, someone who might end up there before us and faster than us. But we should not be inviting while we are not there or at least we're not even caring to be there and striving to be there. And of course, more direct than that when Allah Azza wa tells us in the Quran what? Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu lima taquluna ma la taf'aloon kabura maqtan inda Allahi an taqulu ma la taf'aloon O you who believe, or you have attained faith, why do you speak that which you do not do? Great abomination indeed in the sight of Allah is that you say that which you do not do. Wa Invitation, that's why da'wah to Allah, the results of which generally we would say would not be blessed by Allah Azza wa It will not be that fruitful and that beautiful spiritual fruit in it. Sometimes because not only or not the fault of the receiver, but the fault of the carrier, the fault of the da'iyah amongst us. Because we lack maybe, first of all, Rabbuna Allah in our qulub, we lack it. It's not there firmly. Second, or that we are not striving at least to do what we know is right. And that we do that sometimes with other motivations and other internal drives, such as yani, some types of profitability, sometimes of um, um, personal preferences, sometimes of personal interests, uh, and so on, and personal drives, and all of those are elements that would uh, more likely unless Allah Azza wa graces us with some special gift of forgiveness of His, those will not be leading to the proper results. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ Second, see da'a, but what I said, I'm not going to say next, is included in what I said before. وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا You see, he said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is better in speech than the one who invites to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and acts righteously. This is the one. And acts. In other words, he, this person is at home. What is doing always his or her best to be at home and to receive the guests, not to invite guests and run away from home or not be at home. وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ and says and declares I am verily of those who are Muslim. In other words, this person is proud to be a Muslim. Not the arrogant pride 
but that spiritual, beautiful, moral pride is proud to be Muslim, does not hide it, does not hide it, does not behave in society, in the streets, at work, in social encounters, where I, does not hide his Muslim personality. I am inani min al muslimin Of course, one cannot be da'i to Allah and occasionally hides from being who he is. And sometimes some of us change our names. What's your name, Mo? What's your name, Mok? That's Mokhtar. <laughs> Mo, Muhammad, Al, what's your name, Al? That's Ali. Yani, we should not ridicule these people. May Allah Azza wa forgive us and forgive them, but out of fear and out of weakness sometimes. We're not talking about those, but we're just talking about the fact of being, alhamdulillah, proud or not of what you are. As a Muslim, a beautiful name like Muhammad should not be conceived. Beautiful name like Ahmed should not be concealed. Beautiful name like Aisha should not be concealed. These are names to be proud of. They are beautiful. The meanings are beautiful. وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And shows that in his or her life. In ways that are of course beautiful, especially as a da'iyah to Allah Azza wa Jal, by his attitude or her attitude, also is a da'wah, is an invitation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thirdly, وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ There's even a deeper level of that. إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And what's a deeper level of that? To be a Muslim? Naam? Naam? Yes, what? A deeper level of Islam. We're talking about it. وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ That that deeper level of Islam is when when that concept of being a Muslim, of its tawheed and its consequences, is deeply rooted in your heart. When your qalb had lovingly, lovingly and passionately surrendered itself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lovingly and passionately and humbly also surrendered itself to Allah Azzawajal. in the way when I say your qalb my qalb or your qalb meaning when we say qalb and your qalb what do we mean when I see speak at that level what do I mean what do we mean what do I mean <laughs> do you feel it huh? desires wants Desires, wants, needs, yes, drives, wills, passions, that's why I use the word passions, the attachments inside of you, the drives inside of you, the moment-to-moment drives inside of you, and volitions inside of you. Those, when those are lovingly and passionately in surrender to Allah's will and to Allah's love, Subhanahu wa ta'ala to Allah's volition when they are so. That's the deeper level of, 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 of Islam. And of course, the text teaches us that. A man comes to Rasulullah and asks him, Ya Rasulullah, Mal Islam? Ya Rasulullah, what is Islam? You replied, this is related by Imam Ahmed and others, Ya Rasulullah, what is Islam? He replies, Sallallahu Alaihi. Al-Islam an yuslima qalbuka lillahi ta'ala. First he said, Al-Islam an yuslima qalbuka lillahi ta'ala. Islam is when your qalb surrenders, that is lovingly surrenders to Allah. Your heart, meaning your drive, your attachments, your likes, your preferences, your priorities, your emotions. Imagine that. Not only your thoughts and your ideas and all of that, when it is all of that is in surrender, loving surrender, voluntary, loving surrender, conscious surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then second, 
ويسلم المسلمون من يدك ولسانك and that others Muslims are secure from your tongue and your hand from your words and your power and your might وقال إنني I come back to وقال إنني من المسلمين I am of those who surrender themselves lovingly their hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ this is the one who is there is no one better than him or her in speech in action than the one like that so it's not so so don't say that Allah says who is better in speech than the da'ya to Allah Azza wa is that correct? no he didn't say that he first said وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ before that he said الذين قالوا إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقام تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ولا تخاف ولا تحزن وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون نحن أولياءكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ولكم فيها ما تشتهي أنفسكم ولكم فيها ما تدعون نزل من الغفور الرحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes. Allah maghfir lana wa tub alayna. Allah maghfir lana wa tub alayna. Waj'alna minhum bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahmin ya rabbal alameen. Wa la tastawi al-hasanatu wa la al-sayyi'ah. Wa la tastawi al-hasanatu wa la al-sayyi'ah. Indeed, a good act, a beautiful act, a virtuous act is not equal to an evil act, they cannot be the same. <coughs> they cannot be the same. Of course they're not the same. The fitra of the human being knows that. But sometimes the human fitra, the human innate qualities are so tempered with and so uh, blemished and so stained and so distorted that even this notion sometimes to some of us is if you know needs proof or is unnatural and therefore you know committing a crime or killing or stealing or usurping or violating somebody else's personal right and so on seems to be well it's okay i can do that and so on La. similarly being charitable is not equal to being miser Similarly, being grateful is not equal to being ingrate. Similarly, alhamdulillah, uh, being patient is not like being impatient. Similarly, being just and fair is not like being unjust <coughs> and unfair. Alhamdulillah. Similarly, being benevolent and magnanimous, muhsin, is not like being demanding. No. Similarly, being prayerful is not like being someone who is dry, spiritually dry. No. Forgiving is not equal to unforgiving. Allah, first of all, sets this axiom for us. This is a principle. These are constants in our deed. <coughs> After affirming that for us as a rule, he gives us an example to apply it. And what's an example to apply it? Repel by that which is most or more or most beautiful or more beautiful. What does this mean? Repel, i.e., an act of wrong, an act of evil that you were subjected to or you were exposed to. The way, the best way to repel it is to repel it by something that is, by an act that is better or best. And why is this mentioned in this context? Why is this mentioned in this context? Because in this context of da'wah to Allah Azza wa Jal, 
you are going to find, obviously, as the Sunan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his creation indicate, as the laws of Allah Azza wa Jal in society indicate, the, the social, the normative laws, the political laws, the psychological attitudes, the historical facts, the economic conditions, and so on, the family conditions, all of that, it requires that when you are exposed to, with two people and you live amongst people, there are always conflicts. Number, one. Number two, when you are one who is trying to change yourself and produce change, you're going to encounter even more resistance and subject to more possible conflicts because you're going to interact with people of different persuasions and different inclinations and different capacities intellectual and moral and spiritual and so on at all these levels home and outside and that's you're going to be exposed therefore on average to from time to time and sometimes some people more frequently than others at some times to that which is perceived as what? As siya, as harm to you in this way. And that, he says, and in that, when you encounter that, these people that he describes, subhanahu wa ta'ala, before, should be endowed with the capacity and the will to react in this way, to repel that harm and that challenge or that uh, <clears throat> uh, vile and, and, and vice and harm to repel those with hasana, with that which is better. Allahumma wa fiqna. Allahumma wa fiqna. Allahumma wa fiqna. Allahumma wa fiqna. <clears throat> do, do you see what, what it is saying to us? By the way, where does this start? How, how would you apply it in your own cases? Where, where is an example that comes first to your mind to apply? No one? Conflicts between siblings? That matter? Conflicts between families? Jazakallah khair al-Hassan. That's what I would go first. Conflicts at home conflicts at home between siblings brothers and brothers brothers and sisters conflicts at home between husband and wife conflicts at home between parents and children especially if our children are little that way if we don't apply that rule something is, is very wrong with us if the children are small children, not even teenagers. Infa'abilati hiya ahsan. But again, but again. After Allah tells us that, and that the result, He promises Azza wa Jal, the result is always beautiful and positive and removes conflicts. One of the means of conflict resolution is this. Because Allah says in that same ayah, in that same verse, in that same ayah, I'm sorry. And thereby, this is the result. The one between whom and you there was enmity becomes a committed friend. Conflict resolution. Rule number one, idfa billati ahsan. This is a universal law, an Islamic universal law for conflict resolution. And at the end of that he says, it's like however, it's like, however, وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ الله أكبر 
يا رب تب علينا يا رب اغفر لنا يا رب طهر قلوبنا يا رب زكي أنفسنا يا رب ارزقنا 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 ذلك الذي رزقت عبادك المقربين من صفاء القلوب من صفاء القلوب وحق اليقين يا أرحم الراحمين So he says it's like however وما يلقاها only those only those who are perseverantly patient shall be given this gift. وَمَا يُلَقَّى يُلَقَّى In other words, it will be made to come upon them. It will be made to come to them, to meet them. وَمَا يُلَقَّى إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا those who are sabr. And sabr, just remind you and myself and help try to remind each other by thinking sometimes together. Sabr requires what? Are you sabr? Are you sabr, brother and sister? Are you sabr? Am I sabr? What does sabr mean? There cannot be sabr if I am not in conflict. Number one. Sabr comes only when something is happening to me or around me that I do not consent to, that I do not approve of, that I do not like, and that seems and that somehow affects me in some perceived adverse way. Is it clear? Sabr means... I react to that with keeping it inside and not externalizing it and not showing anger externally and not showing the displeasure and the dissatisfaction Inter- externally, although internally I could be feeling bitterness. And again, there is no sabr without being challenged. If there is no sabr, there is no special fruit. There is no special fruit. The fruit of the bitterness of sabr is very sweet. The fruit of the bitterness of sabr is very sweet. But if there is no bitterness, there is no fruit, there is no sweetness. That means to you and to me, if, if we take this Rabbuna Allahu thumma istaqamu, part of istiqama is to have internalized this meaning and, and I ask Allah to make me once I am subjected to a challenge in my life, that I feel bitter about and it affects me adversely, that my reaction would be one of sabr. And it is through that that Allah has promises, has promised. If you do that and you strive to do that, by the way, Rasulullah teaches us if you strive to do that, Allah will make us people that are patient. <laughs> And this is what it is meant. وَمَا يُلَقَّهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا Sabr, sabr, sabr. That's why they say there is no wali of Allah, special wali, that is the special wali which you might call in English saint, but he, in the proper Islamic <coughs> understanding of it, without sabr. Never. وَمَا يُلَقَّهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا Second, وَمَا يُلَقَّهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ Only one with a great fortune I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, only one with, who is he's greatly fortunate, <coughs> only one with uh, truly a special destined share to him from Allah Azza wa would be granted this gift. And what is that gift? You can come back to it. What is that gift? Jannah or? More directly, what was talked about, because that was before it was talked about. Just close to that, 
to this before he Allah says wa ma what is that na idfa billati hiya ahsan mush sabr itself idfa billati hiya ahsan repel that which is harmful to you evil by that which is ahsan more beautiful this is what is wa ma yulaqqa illa alladhina sabar this is granted to those who are patient and show patience and truly are, are very fortunate. This is what it is. As sabr miftahu, as they say, faraj. As sabr miftahu al faraj. Man sabra dafara. Sabr is the key to relief. Sabr, patience is key to relief. In other words, all of us, inna ma'al usri, yusra. Inna ma'al usri, yusra, says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, these are some of the, Allah, some of the um, reflections from some of what recited last time and, and today from this ayat, as you noticed, as you noticed, uh, the meanings of which not only are very spiritual and very moral, but also very what? Practical, I said. They're very practical. They, uh, they spread over the, of the spectrum of many, many aspects of our lives. Uh, and especially those who are da'wah oriented uh, to virtue, to khair, to peace to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Salli Allahumma wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in ala da khalqik wa rida nafsik wa zinat arshik wa midada kalimatik. Any question? Excuse me. Yes. Is there a distinction between uh, between sabr and um, the act of and the evil or the uh, the aggressions against you uh, versus the evil or, or aggression being against someone around you that you are uh, so you are. Uh, in a situation where someone else an injustice is being done, an injustice in the Islamic sense, <coughs> which may even mean um, maybe we're in a place where music is being played and you, know, uh, you yourself do not like that, but those who you're in charge of, and you also don't like that for them. So how is the, is the self-restraint, the patience, is it different in instances where the injustice is against others, or is it, it versus it being just for yourself? <clears throat> I think first that patience, whether against me or against someone very close to me, upon whom. I have towards whom I have responsibility. I think it's the same thing. What do I mean by that? Because patience does not mean you don't, patience does not mean you like that. Patience does not mean you don't feel bitter. See, whether it happens to you or it happens to your son or to your wife or to your daughter, excuse me, uh, something that you do not like, that is vile, that is not virtuous, that is immoral, or that is illegal, or kada. You don't like it for yourself, you don't like it for him, you don't like it for her as well. And inside of you, there must be some 
feeling of displeasure and dissatisfaction and bitterness and maybe even anger. What does patience mean? You don't externalize that. In other words, you could be trying to change and to reform a situation and inside you're maybe even angry and you're better, but you don't show it. And it means you act in ways that are, that don't depict that you are angry, yet you are for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla. For example. And of course that way is more constructive and more fruitful than externalizing that bitterness and that anger, especially at these levels. Because that's not a wise way to produce change in this case, for instance. So that's, I think, one way you know, also to, to look at it. And of course, there is a vast array of discourse when it comes to the concept of al-amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar. Because you gave an example in which uh, actually it comes not under the title only of patience, but under the title of Al-Amr bil Ma'roof al Nahi Anil Munkar. And that has, of course, a longer discourse. Patience is an element in Al-Amr bil Ma'roof al Nahi Anil Munkar. Do you see what I said? Because it's an issue of Amr bil Ma'roof al Nahi Anil Munkar. Patience is one of the elements in enjoining that which is right and forbidding that which is evil. And there are other things as well that under that enter under the, this title and the realm of Al-Amr al-Ma'ruf al munkar uh, of which again a general rule because time does not permit <coughs> is again we should despise evil inside of us we should love virtue inside of us as well number two in addition to patience as an element of Al-Amr al-Ma'ruf al munkar uh, knowledge, proper knowledge, pertaining to the issue at hand that I seek to reform and to change through Amr bin Ma'ruf and al Munkar. I need knowledge, I need proper knowledge pertaining to that situation. Sometimes I need details pertaining to that situation. Another element of Amr Ma'ruf and al Munkar is I should also know the conditions of this person who is committing this Munkar after I know with Ilm that it is Munkar. What are the conditions? What are the circumstances? I need to know as much of that as possible because all of that is important before making a decision of how to produce or to see how to seek to produce a positive change of that which also I need to keep as, as a rule that's very important, that I should not ultimately change something evil by using another evil. Or by using an evil that is greater than the evil I'm attempting to ameliorate, to change, to modify. It's very important. When you have a child, a little child, uh, your son or your daughter, four, five, six, seven years of age, and they have done them, them mistakes. And then mistakes, of course, you have to keep in mind, they're not like you. And you are not mature yet anyways, no matter what you tell me you are. You're not mature, fully mature yet intellectually. You're not fully mature yet morally. You're not fully mature yet spiritually, etc., etc. So the child is not mature at all, intellectually and so on and so forth. So for me to get angry at the child as though I'm holding him or her accountable in the same way I'm holding myself accountable if I am, what do you call that? Rarely do we pay attention to this. What do you call that? Are you crazy? It seems most of us are crazy. What are, what, are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you treating a child at the level 
of you who is 50 or 27 or 30 or 40 and you expect the child to be thinking like you and remembering like you, it seems you don't know a lot. You don't know a lot. Second, you don't go and then, because the child, for example, you know, he did something, stained this or broke this or hit his sister or hit her brother, and then you go slam. child is, is terrorized, hurt. Now, this is an example of what? It's an example of what? If you consider his action as vile, if you want to call it evil, how did you change it? By an evil that is worse. And the rule of law and this, you see, before you go to apply it to the level of court or politics, this is where it applies. And the rule of law says what I told you. You do not. لا تغير منكرا بمنكر. تغير المنكر من غير منكر والأمر بالمعروف بالمعروف. And then ارتكاب أخف الضررين, the rule of committing the lesser of the two evils. So what is the lesser of the two evils? Slam or the child's mistake. What is the lesser of the two evil? If you call his, 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 his mistake uh, his mistake an evil. The child, the child. So let it be. That's what it means. Don't use that method. You cannot do that. Wahakana. That realm enters here, my dear brother Rafi, that your question comes more under the realm of Al-Amr bil Ma'ruf al it has uh, another longer discourse, uh, inshallah ta'ala, but I think with this would be, would be enough, bi-ithnillah ta'ala, to elucidate uh, uh, One more question here, sent by a brother online. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow his servants to slip, i.e. to sin, to engender in them sincere tawbah, following which they will become closer to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is there any statement of Allah in the Quran or sayings of the Prophet sallallahu to that effect? Jazakumullah khair. Naam, yes, the ulama, rahimahullah ta'ala, the scholars of this ummah, the salaf of this ummah, some of the sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, the ulama of the qulub, have said, yes indeed, sometimes, again, that's in the knowledge of Allah azza wa jal. That's not a knowledge we have. Keep that in mind, that the sinner has before he or she commits a sin. Nobody has access to that. That's min ilm al ghaib. That's of the knowledge of the unseen. That's in the realm of the qada and the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. That's the realm of qada and qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. That sometimes, if a person had sinned, had slipped. And that is followed. This is how I would put it. And that is followed by a powerful, sincere, remorseful return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tawbah, that mashallah ignites the heat of, of, of sorrowfulness, the heat of sorrow, the heat of, of, of pain for having committed that sin in one's relationship with Allah azza wa jal. And eyes that are overwhelmed with warm tears in moments of solitude and that had engendered that then and the person develops a momentum greater than before to the obedience of Allah Azza wa Jal. then the ulama rahimahullah ta'ala say having meditated the Quran and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
that that is for them ultimately something good. It does not mean that to sin is good so that you repent. No, it doesn't mean that. What they mean is if you had sinned and this is what occurred, then ultimately now we know, subhanAllah, in a relative sense, I underline, in a relative sense, we would know that that sin you committed, subhanAllah, in a sense, I underline, in a sense, not in a direct sense, in a sense was the sabab, was the cause to this uh, beautiful uh, return to Allah Azza wa and this beautiful condition of love, of sincerity, of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what they had said. But beforehand, we do not know. We cannot say, I sin so that, I repent so that I get near to Allah. That's not what it means. In retrospect, we can say that. In retrospect, we can say that. In retrospect, the awliya, ulama of Allah Azza wa Jal know, subhanAllah, that that sin led to this state of nearness to Allah Azza wa Jal. To that state in which the person again turns in this powerful state of repentance, raises his or her hands, crying and weeping and lamenting and feeling pain in the qalb, in dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of that are conditions in which the abd is drawing nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Example of that in the Qur'an? Well, they say what? What's the example of that in the Qur'an? Adam alayhi salam. Adam alayhi salam. He committed the dhamb. He committed the dhamb. As Allah Azza wa always for eternity has known, and it seems to us from the direct readings that that then led to where? Led to where? Led to earth. Ah, now besides having left Jannah, left to earth meant what? As the Quran teaches us, <coughs> vicegerency on earth, khilafa. <laughs> Strange. Adam, after that, has become what? In the Arabic word, Khalifatullah. After that, Adam has become the Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. After that, he has become, I have goosebumps. After that, Adam alayhi salam has become the most beautiful representation of the divine attributes on earth after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa because the most Adam having come on earth produced what? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is the most beloved creature to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the extent that there are some texts that teach us some ulama of hadith say those texts are maqbul, are authoritative, are hasan, that were it not for Muhammad sallallahu to come, Adam would not have been created. So was the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. That's a text hasan, in the kathir min ahli al-hadith. See, this is what it led to. In the wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jal. But nobody knew that before. Nobody prepared for that before. That's in the realm of the qada and qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that, of course, to the mu'min as-sadiq, to the truthful, faithful man or woman of tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jal and of sidq fi mahabbati Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam in the beautiful, sincere law for, for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam finds in such meanings hope. Finds hope and never despairs. And never despairs. And indeed increases in his or her devotion and love for Allah and his Rasul on account of this added mysterious, subtle, beautiful dimension of Allah's Rahmah. 
and of Allah's wisdom. That's what it adds, my dear brothers and sisters. Uh, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa teaches us, at this point I don't have the text specifically in my mind uh, verbatim, but he teaches us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that sometimes yani, a person who, um, who, who, who spends his night in fear from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on account of his dhunub, repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is, more, is nearer to Allah than the person who had stayed in, in ibadah while, while in a state of conceitedness, of ujb. Oh, he's so amazed. Wow, oh, wow, I did it. And he's conceited and he's self-admiring. While the person had spent the night weeping and crying on account of them committed. Which one is closer? The person who spent the night crying and weeping to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa hakadha. Many other texts and many other words and many other experiences of the salaf of this ummah, of the predecessors of this ummah, who confirm also to that meaning. Wallahu ta'ala ala masallillahu ala sayyidina wa mawlana. محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين وأصحابه الميامين التابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم طهر قلوبنا اللهم طهر قلوبنا اللهم طهر قلوبنا وذلل لطاعتك وخدمتك جوارحنا واختب لنا بالباقيات الصالحات أعمالنا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank <coughs> you. <coughs>